Korea Atlas just lit up. In fact, it got seven and a half times brighter than it was, just as it made its closest approach to the sun at perihelion. So coincidentally, this is far more brighter than an Oort cloud object would turn all at once. It went from being really dim to being pretty bright. I mean, it's still probably fairly dim for an Oort cloud object, but to have that level of magnitude of brighten then is unprecedented. The other thing that is unprecedented is it's blue. <laughs> And we don't know why. Furthermore, it went from green, like my walls, to a reddish, which is kind of a dust color, to blue. Now, the oddball thing about it having been green is that's typical for a comet if it has uh, two carbon uh, atoms tied together in a molecule, di you know, diatomic carbon. But it didn't. It had mostly CO2, which should not have been green. So the fact it was green was odd. And then it went kind of reddish, which is to be expected uh, from a lot of dust reflecting sunlight. And then it went to blue. So this is odd. Red, green, blue, just kind of like the colors on a screen, you know, <laughs> on a, on a uh, CR, old CRT screen. That's odd. Uh, but this, this whole thing is just further indication of the oddities, the absurdities of this object. It just never ceases to amaze us. It's always got something new, something strange. So what you need to know is even though it's currently hidden from terrestrial telescopes behind the sun, uh, it went through this uh, solar conjunction, uh, you know, uh, relative to Earth's location back in the 21st of October when we couldn't uh, see it, the, when it was most opposite from us. And then it went through the, uh, the perihelion maneuver on the 29th of October. I say August early, <laughs> October. Anyway, so um, it's interesting, this unfavorable opposition to Earth. Uh, Avi Loeb, in his website, he posts articles on Medium, suggests that this was a possible hint of design. Of, uh, you know, why would it be doing its most interesting things while it's hard to see? And we're going to cover while this most interesting part of its orbit suddenly we're not seeing anything at all from the best instruments that we've got to look at it. So um, that's pretty interesting in and of itself. But know this, there is uh, observations actually from Stereo, Soho, and GOES-19. These are various uh, uh, conographs and heliospheric imagers, and I'm going to show the images from that right now. <laughs> Hang on to your hats, my friends. Bada bing, bada bang. And there it is. This is what we've detected from those instruments. Now, stereo, which is your solar terrestrial relations uh, observatory right here, originally consisted of two identical spacecraft. They were launched back in 2006. And uh, stereo B was a little slower. Stereo A was a little quicker than Earth. And Stereo B has not been operational since 2014, so Stereo A is the only one we're getting images from. You know, the idea of Stereo is you can see something with two angles at one time and get more data, kind of like we with our binocular vision. You know, you can get parallax. Uh, you can see different perspectives, like a solar flare or something like that. So, but unfortunately, we lost uh, Stereo B, as I said, back in 2014. But... Uh, so these observations were made by two cameras, the H1 and the Core 2 camera on Stereo A. Uh, and then on the, uh, there's something called the uh, six, S E C C I H. how would you pronounce that? Sex G, <laughs> Sun Earth Connection Coronal uh, and Heliospheric Investigation Instrument Suite. Is that a mouthful or what? <laughs> Anyway, so these are images of this thing. That would be, the, I guess, the velocity vector there. So of uh, the comet, this is, these are all Comet 3i Atlas here from different uh, sources. Thing here. Anyway, <laughs> so anyway, what we're looking at here is uh, SOHO, uh, which gave us uh, this image down here. SOHO is the Solar and Heliospheric Observatory. It was launched in 1995, ah, you know, 30 years ago. 
it orbits the sun's uh the sun earth uh, lagrange point one so that's the point the lagrange point between uh the sun and the earth but it carries this uh lasco large angle and spectral uh spectral uh yeah, spectrometric chronograph <laughs> instrument. And then there's this uh, GOES-19, which was launched in uh, 2024. And it's the uh, weather satellite operating at geosynchronous orbit, carrying the uh, CCOR-1, compact chronograph-1 chronograph. Yeah, okay, that's this guy up here. <laughs> anyway, so... <laughs> Uh, anyway, so this data, as I said, it showed that uh, the, the intensity increased seven and a half times more visual power. Now, that's measured in negative numbers in astronomy. The smaller the number, the more visible it is. It's kind of backwards to what we would think, right? That's just the way astronomers are about things. <laughs> so the, the uh, core one also has observed a glow extending out to 300,000 kilometers around 3i atlas so it's got quite a corona around it because it's thought that the core nucleus is probably only five kilometers wide that's what we'd really like to image but we're not going to have any instruments that's going to see just the nucleus because the very best next image we're going to get from the, the james webb telescope is only 40 kilometers per pixel so you're not going to resolve anything less than 40 kilometers and we should be able to get images like that on the best images on its closest approach to uh, the Earth on the 19th of December. Unfortunately, unfortunately, um, it just turns out that uh, the best time to view it was when it was in perihelion next to the sun. And our best instruments, of course, was the high-res camera on the Mars uh, Reconnaissance Orbiter and uh, the high-rig camera on Tia-1 from the Chinese. We'll come back to that later. So why aren't we getting those images? We'll talk about that in a little bit. But anyway... <clears throat> So following this uh, 2025, October 29, perihelion, the 3i atlas will return, as I said, uh, to be visible in the twilight here on Earth. Uh, closest approach, as I said, will be on 19 December 2025, just coming up, uh, just before Christmas. <laughs> and we'll get some uh, good ground-based observations from the Hubble, well, not ground-based, but Earth-based observations from the Hubble and Webb at that time, but still not able to re resolve the nucleus, but we'll get a lot of data about this object. So man, again, why, why did it brighten up? We really don't know. Maybe it fired its braking engines. Maybe we'll see it decelerating soon. <laughs> well, I think we might, we might be able to discern that already, unless it's a real slow G. <laughs> Remember how much thrust, look at my last video, how much thrust I said it would take to really move this object? Incredible amount. So maybe they're just putting on the slow brakes. <laughs> of course, Avi Loeb actually suggested it, it was brighter than it should have been like, you know, a couple of months ago. And he was asking if this thing had internal lights. Could it have something to do with how it got so bright? <laughs> Fast rate of, right, of brightening, that is. So, um, yeah. This brightening, like I said, far exceeds the brightening rate of most Oort cloud comets with similar distances from the sun. And the reason for that just isn't clear. There's just a lot of stuff that we don't know. But what uh, Avi Loeb has further postulated is that uh, it being blue, uh, he thinks it still should be red, reflecting the uh, sunlight for this dust at this point. And he's saying because it's the nucleus the surface should be an order of magnitude colder than the 58,000 Kelvin degree, uh, the photosphere of the sun. Um, he don't think it should be blue at all. And he said, this is really the ninth anomaly he would add to his list of improbabilities uh, against this thing being an ordinary comet. Well, it's not ordinary, whatever it is. But then again, like I said, there's spectrographic data, which seems to indicate that it is Maybe an asteroid, <laughs> but uh, but to have this color, he's he asked, does it employ a power source hotter than the sun? That's what I'm saying. The sun has got this uh, photos. Uh, it's got you know five thousand eight hundred degrees 
Kelvin in its photosphere. So uh, that's what you'd be expecting. So he's going to, this thing got a real hot source of reflected sunlight should be the only energy upon this thing if it's a natural object. And that's only 770 watts per meter square or shy of anything reaching 5,800 degrees Kelvin. <laughs> so again, that's why he said, should this be our ninth anomaly to add to the list of this object? That's really how he's counting this thing. So, um, uh, you know, let's, let's stop the share and we'll talk a little bit about this a little bit further. Hang on. Well, let me uh, move this around a little bit, maybe blow it up because I'm not sure the way I got this set up. You're seeing the best of the images here. There we go. These are the latest images. Uh, now, these are from different dates, if you notice. Uh, 18 to 24 October. Uh, this is from September. Uh, October, so yeah, it's still some of these instances I mentioned are like in L1. Some of them are in geosynchronous, something uh, an instrument in geosynchronous isn't going to see it right now. So, 26 October, Soho has got uh, the latest image really right here, Soho, of what they've shown here. That is the latest. So, let's stop the share. Halo, we got to look at Soho <laughs> anyway. So let's just chat about this a little bit more. Let's talk about this whole oddity of not getting images from it. Because what did I say? I just did the whole video. Is how come we're not seeing images? And, you know, it's been attributed, you know, from the uh, high-res camera on the uh, Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter to government shutdown. But as I mentioned the high-res instrument is not run by NASA directly. No, it's not run by NASA. It's run by the University of Arizona. Ah, uh, and they're not on shutdown. And furthermore, there are other universities involved and some independent grad students. So you would think all these grad students would, if they got some real hot data, would want to run to the press with it and get famous. Are we hearing crickets? Why crickets? Okay, well, the Chinese got the Tiwan uh, uh, orbiter, and it's got resolution similar to, uh, should have resolution similar to the high-res camera. It's high-res camera. Should have resolution similar to the high-res camera. <laughs> so why is it there's crickets in China, too? Uh, and I mentioned previously that it's been attributed to maybe they're not tracking it. Well, it turns out I believe they actually were getting pictures from their high-rate camera on the TL1 earlier. Why it black now? Hmm. They've got other instruments that could have been watching this thing, and they all went black about the same time. The U.S. government had its shutdown just kind of conveniently, strangely. So what other instruments does China have that's looking at this? And why did China get quiet? Uh, well, they have a radio dish called the uh, Xinjiang, probably murdered the pronunciation, and I don't speak Mandarin <laughs> or Cantonese, so uh, no, Chinese, I don't speak those languages, you know, other than order and takeout, maybe. <laughs> I'm probably not even good at pronouncing that. So, uh, so the Xinjiang 35-meter radio dish at the... Uh, er <laughs> Uh, Urumqi, I know they don't pronounce it that way, observatory. Anyway, this thing was cited as a primary instrument that China used for their deep space uh, network, the deep space communications and tracking network for tracking the comet's position and observing its signal strength. It recorded a signal drop just before the comet moved in the solar conjunction. Well, that's to be expected. It, you know, we're talking the solar conjunction from Earth is when it was directly opposite from Earth. Now, uh, it's in perihelion, it's still where we can't see it uh, directly from Earth instruments. That means in Earth orbit also, um, unless you get some degree change or something, <laughs> which we don't think we get anything late. We had a, a solar polar orbit at one time. I don't know what happened to that. But anyway, so we had the high-rate camera, as I mentioned, the high-resolution imaging camera on TON-1 orbiter. 
And this thing, as I said, should have got images. We do not have an explanation for why they're not getting images from this. Now, nothing's been released. We got the uh, Purple Mountain Observatory, uh, which has optical telescopes. And uh, it's um, it was tracking at one time. And, of course, the Chinese, the Chinese Deep Space uh, Network radar infrastructure. Uh, these were all involved in tracking, but for some reason, they shut a lot of them down. Now, they claim the shutdowns were due to preparation for the Chang'e 7 lunar mission. They say they had to shut all these, they had to redirect and reprioritize them for an upcoming lunar mission. And calibration of the, I got no idea how you pronounce this, it's spelled Q U E Q I A O, Queen Wow, I don't know, to relay satellite. Now, this thing has uh, reallocated its resources to be calibrated. So, now you think, okay, maybe that we're not seeing from T1 because the relay side. No, T1 had direct communication to ground. It didn't go, not go need to go through any network. So why all at once? Oh, we're going to recalibrate our uh, uh, let's just call it Q2 relay satellites. That's easy for me to pronounce, and the uh, other the rest of the the network. Why recalibration and redirecting right in the most exciting period of probably solar system history when we've got an inner strange, unexplained interstellar object reaching perihelion. Now, why is that significant? We're going to like so, oh, we're going to see this thing on the 19th of December. Yeah, but it won't be as active. And if it was going to do a Herman uh, Orberth, <laughs> an Orberth maneuver, uh, it would have been done, started yesterday. Yeah, when it got bright. <laughs> it would have started yesterday. So why? Why suddenly they decide this all at once to shut this stuff down? Now, you know, I've been querying about this, and it's been claimed that, well, uh, there are maybe some protocols where China just don't release stuff as fast as public, but there's been some insider scoop that suggests from some Chinese astronomers that some things can get classified. So what's happening? Why is it just crickets? When suddenly we get this really exciting event, crickets. I don't know. What do you think? What do you think? Why crickets all at once? It doesn't make sense. Why isn't some grad student releasing uh, the high-res camera video or pictures video? Why aren't we getting stuff from the high-rick camera? Why are both nations suddenly going, mm -mm 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 -mm. So we don't have them? Is it the data hasn't been processed? Which you think this would be high priority data, especially since China's not shut down, the government shut down. Or the University of Arizona. Where's it at? Where's it at? And why did it get so bright all of a sudden? <laughs> why did it go poof? Hmm. Really strange. Strange stuff. Many strange things in the skies. Who knows what the mysteries uh, are laying in the skies, in the skies. <laughs> so. I just want to say, uh, guys, keep looking up. Because who knows what's coming down. <laughs> Hopefully none of this. <laughs> anyway, thank y'all for watching. Uh, be sure to check out my video. I'll post one here. I'll put a banner up there related to 3i Atlas. So watch that. Thank you. Greg out.